This morning, I'm so excited to be here. It's such a privilege. My name is Pastor Josh. I'm a pastor here at Grace, a pastor of Grace in Espanol. I'm so excited to be here. Man, didn't it bless you when this team just went into Spanish like that? That was awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank you guys for that. It, it's such a blessing. Oh, if you would go to Psalm 103 with me, if you have your Bibles, I believe the Lord wants to speak so, so specifically, so directly to our hearts about something that is so true in this today. We're going to talk about a, a theme. We're, we've been following this theme on the Holy Spirit about the power of God and, and, and leading up to the sun, Pentecost Sunday that is next week where we're going to be learning more. But today is specifically the specific teaching that God wants to teach us. That I believe that God is leading us in his word it is about him being our healer. Christ is our healer. How many believe that this morning? God is our healer. Christ is our healer. Man, it, he, I, just, I just sense like such a, like a reverence for who God is today in the room. God, we, we just want to take a moment even right now before I even get the message. God, you're the, you're, the in, you're the king, Lord God, and you're in this place. God, this, is, this isn't even about my sermon today, God. God, it's about your presence. It's about your holiness, how beautiful you are, God. And just with a resounding, as a room, Lord God, we just collectively say we love you. We love you, Jesus. Thanks for being here. Thank you for your presence with us. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. As I was preparing for this message, I, I, I began to study about the different names of who God is. How do you know in the time of, of, of the scriptures, the, the names that were given or attributed to somebody were given very purposefully because it carried the essence of the nature that they have. Right, it carried the very essence of who they are. I mean, no, that's a little different than today, right? Names don't carry as much of a meaning today in our culture, even though they still do to a degree. And, and I believe that even in our culture, we do see like a, a, a version of this that is very similar. How many of you growing up, somebody give you a nickname? And oftentimes, why were you given a nickname? Because of something that had to do with your character or something that you have done. I remember when I first moved to this country, I came here and I, I discovered the sport American football for the first time in my life. I was like, this game is awesome. <laughs> I love this game. These guys, they play so hard. They hit each other. They run with the ball. They go, this is so different. I love it. And I fell in love with that sport. And I remember one year I came and I started playing American football with all my buddies in my neighborhood. I started playing with all of them. We started catching it. And my favorite position was the guy who would re return the punt when they would catch it. They would punt the ball. You would catch the ball. I would catch the ball. And my favorite part was just running as fast as I could to reach the other side without getting killed. You know, that's the best part of the game. And I was running so fast. I was going from one side to the other. I was juking everybody out here and there. And then I would enter the touchdown zone and I would celebrate. And all my buddies came around me. And then somebody gave me a nickname that day that stuck. Anytime we play football, they say, hey, we got Speedy Gonzalez on our team. Let's go. And I was like, wow, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> because they saw, why did they attribute that name to me? It's because of my speed. Right? They were going, I was like, he's fast, Let's get, that's his nickname. They attributed that nickname to me. So when we played, they were like, I want him on my team. I want to run with him. It captured an essence of who it was. You're nowhere near as deep, but it had some significance that captured something about who I was. That I was fast. And I also spoke Spanish. I didn't speak English at the time. So they captured that essence. But how many know God, his names are much deeper and much truer than a silly nickname that I got when I was a kid. The names of God are much higher, much truer, and it captures his essence of who he is. They're not nicknames of God. They're the names of God. They're the names of who God is. So I began to ponder about some names, and I just, even as I'm saying these names, my, my heart begins to move. How about this? Let's see if your heart moves with mine. El Shaddai. He is the all-sufficient God. How about El Roy, God who sees me? 
How many hear that name and your heart moves? God, thank you. Thank you, you see me. How about Jehovah Shalom? God, oh, my peace. Jehovah Jireh. Have you heard that beautiful song? Jireh, I love it. He is our provider. And then today I want to land on this one. Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who heals you. Christ is our healer, church. Christ is our healer. And today, I want to walk with you through three principles of God's healing. If you have your Bible, if you're taking notes, would you go there to Psalm 103 with me? We're going to read verses 1 through 5. And here, listen to this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Oh, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. How many are grateful he's a forgiving God? Who heals all your diseases. How many are grateful that he's a healing God? Who redeems your life from the pit. Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. How many are grateful he's a merciful God? And who satisfies you so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The first principle of healing I want to draw out is this. One, it's who God is. It's who God is. And it's what he does. Uh, Scripture shows us that the, the intention of God has always been since the very beginning for the healing and the redemption of this world. The name Jehovah Rapha was not given to him just because of a silly nickname, but it was given to him because it captured his nature. Who, who is he? Since the beginning, God created the world not broken. But how many of you here can stand and witness we live in a broken world? It's a world that's broken. Let me tell you, this week reminded me in a very deep way how broken our world really is. How many of you just grieved this week? Just grieved. Something in you just said, something's wrong. Something's broken. Scripture shows us that it is a broken world, but it was not always that way. God created this world with harmony. He created this world in wholeness. He created this world with beauty, with order. It was a, it was a world that was created by him, but what happened in the moment? How many of you know the serpent, the liar, the enemy, the devil came, and he deceived Adam and Eve? In that moment, Scripture shows us that what was once in beautiful harmony, what was once in, in great, great just goodness and, and, and in beauty that was in there at the garden, sin had entered the picture. Transgression had entered the picture. And with that, justice fell upon the earth. With that, a curse fell upon the earth. And then brokenness began like an infection to spread all throughout humanity and all throughout the earth. Even to, in the scriptures tell us that even the earth, the world groans, groans like pain. It groans for its deliverance in Christ Jesus, for the revelation of the sons and the daughters of God. There's a brokenness in this world. But how many know even at the moment that the curse came upon the earth, God had an intention to bring healing and restoration in that moment. A promise came of a Messiah. A promise came of one who would make all things right. A promise came of a one who would break the curse that was upon the earth. A promise of a man named Jesus Christ. A promise of the Son of God. If you go with me to Matthew chapter 8, verse 14. In the book of Hebrews, it starts with the fact that it says that Jesus Christ was the perfect representation of the Father. The perfect representation of who the Father is. If you're in here and you're questioning, God, who are you? God, who are you? God, what are you like? Look to Jesus. He's the very image of who the Father is. 
And here, when you read the Gospels, you look to him and you begin to see what is the nature of God. What is the essence? What is what he wants? What is it what, that he leads us to, that he wants to do? And here in, Ma- in, in Matthew chapter 8, in your own time, we'd read the entire chapter. It's testimony after testimony of what he did. It's a testimony of him cleansing the leper. A testimony of him healing the Roman centurion's guard. The, the, the Jews hated the Romans. They were their oppressors. And Jesus healed the servant because he, he had faith in Christ. He saw what he was doing. But then he goes on, and then verse 14 is here where it lands. And in verse 14 here, Jesus, we see him do this. It says, and when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening, they brought with him many who were oppressed by demons. How many know demons are real? That's not fairy tale from the Bible. Demons are real. He cast out, but they all must bow to the name of Jesus. <laughs> they have no power over us. He cleansed all who were oppressed by demons. He cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah when he said, he took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. So what was happening? Healing was happening. Restoration was happening. And the gospel writer Matthew, where does he point to as evidence of why this is happening? He points to the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah 53, which is a prophecy that came 100 years ago, 100 years ago about the coming Messiah. The promise that came in Genesis was prophesied again in Isaiah, which was Jesus Christ himself. And if we go with me to Isaiah 53, here we're going to read in context what the prophecy was of who God was. Well, who was this Messiah that was coming? Verse 4, Isaiah 53, verse 4, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him as stricken. This is talking about Christ when he was crucified. That, that moment that we see the passion and the love of God demonstrated before all the earth in his in torture and then beating and then crucifixion. It's talking about him. It says, we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. In verse 5, but he, it says this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. When we see Jesus on the cross, we don't see what people then were seeing like, oh man, poor guy. Can't believe that happened to him. But for you and me, what we see is this, but he was pierced for our transgressions. It says then that he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his wounds, we are healed. There's where Matthew looked back to, to when he was seeing what Jesus was doing in all these cities. This is what he looked back to, and he's like, look, he's doing what was prophesied. He's doing, he's he's doing what he was doing. If we are to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the perfect representation of the Father, we see that what is the Father's nature? It is to heal, and it is to restore The blood of Jesus Christ is strong enough to save, and the name of Jesus Christ is strong enough to save, and it's strong enough to heal. The name of Jesus Christ, it carries in essence this thing of of working against the curse and, and the works of the enemy that came upon his creation, which was the entry of sin, which was also the entry of death, which was also the entry of sickness and brokenness. And this is sickness that I'm not just talking about bodily sickness, but how many of you know there's other kinds of sicknesses? Sicknesses to the soul, brokenness to the mind, brokenness and death in the spirit. Jesus Christ is the one who heals all three. He heals body, soul, and spirit. I remember one time, I had a, uh, a group of buddies that something that we would do, that we would love to do, we love going out and evangelizing and praying for people. 
We would love to get together. We would pray, God, would you use us to go and to be your representation wherever we go today? Lead us, Holy Spirit. Lead us, Holy Spirit. And we would pray, and then we would go out. And we had our time of evangelism that we went out on. And then our time of evangelism came to an end. And we were like, let's celebrate with Mexican food. So we went, and we went to a local Mexican restaurant in PA. And as we enter in there, I'm like, man, our evangelism time is over. We're off the clock. Now we get to eat. <laughs> but how I many you know, just because we say we're done, God isn't done. Just because we put a time frame on when God can use me, God has no time frame. God wants to use you in every moment of your life. So we show up. I wasn't paying attention to anything. All I was thinking, I got to get food in me. I got to get food in me. I got to get food in me. I show up. I ordered some great taquitos, some great burritos, and it all arrived. And all my attention was on that food that I was about to feast. And, and, but praise God that somebody in our group was paying attention to what the Holy Spirit was saying. Praise God that somebody in the group wasn't distracted by everything, but had an ear to listen. There was a, one of the women that was working in the restaurant, was walking by, carrying stuff, cleaning our, our table, taking it to the back. And, and this individual, this friend said, I think we need to pray for her. And I'm midway through a bite already. <laughs> I'm just like, uh, what? And he's like, I think we need to pray for her. And I was like, oh, okay. And then they said, um, but I don't think she speaks English, so can you come with me? Can we all go together? <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's do it. So we all got up. We all go to her. We begin to speak to her, and, and she, we come up to her, and she's like, oh, hi. She was confused. Why is this group of young people coming <laughs> up to her in the middle of her workshop to talk to her? And she's asking. She's saying, hello. Hope you, do you enjoy the food? And, and we said, yes, but we said, we asked her just a very simple question. Are you Okay. And then she just goes taken aback by that question a little bit. But then she began to share, no, I'm not. Uh, my back is, for the past four years, I wake up every morning with the most excruciating pain in my back. It, 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 like, it, it makes it like I don't even want to get up in the morning anymore. I don't want to do anything, but, I, but if I don't, my kids will starve. So I need, to, I need to get up. But she was just saying, but this pain that's always with me all the time, even right now, it's just, just like needles going into my back. They said that the doctor told her that it has something to do with a slip disc or different things in her vertebrae and all these things. But she was just saying, it's just in, always in constant pain. So in that moment, when we were met with this, this situation in, in front of us, we, we just said, well, well we, we serve a God who heals can we pray for you? We're Christians. We're Christians. Can we pray for you? And her face, her eyes became as big as raccoons. She was like, pray for me, like right now? And we're like, yeah, can we pray for you? And, and let me tell you, she had no faith in her. All she said was like, I mean, if you want to, sure, you know, let's just get, let's get it over with. I got to get back to work. So we get there and we're like, okay, we're going to pray. Let's pray. And, and then we lay, you know, can we put our hands on you? And she's like, yeah, yeah. So we laid hands on her, and we begin to pray for her. We just, well, Father, we come before you and just thank, thank you for the healing work that you're doing even right now in this woman. Thank you, God, that you're chasing her heart down right now. Thank you for sending us here. Thank you for this divine appointment. In Jesus' name, would you heal her back right now? In Jesus' name, we just begin to pray healing for her, for her. And what I like to do when I'm praying for people, not in the church, but like out in the street, I like to have my eyes open while I'm praying for them. Pro tip, you know, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> you know, somebody grab your wallet and run. <laughs> it's happened, it's happened. But keep, keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. So I just, I had my eyes open. I was just like praying. But not only that, but I, I also love to see when the Holy Spirit comes and touches this person who has no reference of who God is, or maybe a, a skewed one or a broken one, but then she meets the very living God today. In that moment, I'm watching her. She, she's praying. She's like this. She's just humble woman. She's like, yes. And we start praying. We start praying. And all of a sudden, she goes like this. And then she jumps, and she starts backing up. Her eyes just open up, and then tears start streaming down her face. 
Tears start streaming down her face. She has a shock, and, and, and then she begins to weep. But it, it's, it's a weep that comes from deep within. How many know there's different types of crying? There's sometimes a few tears here when that song just hits. That was me this morning. <laughs> when Samuel was leading the same God, I was just like, oh, my gosh. There's that type of crying. But how many know there's a different type of crying? Those, those guttural cries that come from deep within. This was what that woman began to release in the middle of this restaurant. Just this weeping coming out. Weeping, weeping, weeping. And then she starts moving her back. She's moving everything. She's like, the pain is gone. It's gone. She felt this heat, she said, on her back that came on her. And she just began to move. She's weeping, weeping. All of a sudden, we have the attention of the whole restaurant looking at us. And I'm looking around. Everybody's looking at us. <laughs> They're like, what are they doing to this poor lady? You know? <laughs> They just said something that made her, like, sad or something. No, no. She's, like, weeping. And all of a sudden, her kids come out of the kitchen. They're, Mom, Mom, are you okay? And all of a sudden, the, her, the mother's mom comes out of the kitchen, starts coming over closely. And then she's, like, yeah, I'm okay, I'm okay. She's, like, and then she looks at us, and she says, who are you people? <laughs> who are you people? We, we just said, we're Christians. <laughs> You know, we follow Jesus. Jesus is following. He's, he's chasing you. He wants your heart. And then that moment when she heard those, like, words, she, she breaks down again. And what she said just touched me so hard and so much. She just all of a sudden said, why would God do this for me? I don't deserve this. And then she began to tell us her story. At 18, I, I ran away from God. As soon as I was able to get out of my parents' house, I was gone. I didn't believe, I don't, I don't believe in those fairy tales. I, I, I don't believe in, it, it, I think it's just the way people use to manipulate people. I, 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 and then she began to say, I, I even, like, I was just angry at God for what had happened in my life. And I even, I met people that were mean at this one church that I visited one time. So I ran away. I didn't want anything with God. I ran away. I don't want anything with God. And he said, why would he do this for me? And she began to weep, and we just said, he's like, and this is like the greatest privilege, greatest privilege as a believer, as a son and daughter of God, is to introduce somebody to the Heavenly Father. Like when she said, why would he do this? Said, he loves you. He wants you. God healed her body, but how many know God wanted more than just that? God healed and restored her broken body, but God wanted more than that. And then he went after her spirit. The Bible teaches us that before we come to know Christ, before repentance, before born, being born again, it, it says that our spirits are dead in our sin. Our spirits are dead in our sin. Meaning that that part of us that communes with God, that part that comes alive in us, God created each and every single one of us with the, the, the ability to connect with him. That is part of the, we are in the image of God. He gave, he gave us that ability to connect with him. And that part of his heart, the spirit that was in him to connect with him, it says, before we come to know the Lord Jesus, before he beckons us, it's dead. And it needs to be brought back to life. Be born again. So in that moment, she's crying. She's crying. She's like, why would God do this? Why would God do this? And we had the privilege to share the gospel with her. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, came, and he took your place and my place on that cross. All these things that you feel like, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Like, <laughs> like I don't deserve it either. None of us in this room can deserve anything that God does for us. The salvation that he's given us. We don't deserve it. And he's like, but he is here right now knocking at the door of your heart. Would you let him in? And that moment she prayed, we led her in a prayer of salvation, and her spirit came alive. Right before our eyes, we saw a new believer come before us. And in that moment, God not just healed her body, but healed her spirit, brought her back to life. But how do we know? God wasn't even done with that yet. You know, at that point, I'm like, all right, that was awesome. Let's go. God had more. And all of a sudden, as she's sitting there and we're telling her the gospel, she's sitting there. She's looking down. She's looking down. And then the, she looks up at us. And, and I love this. I never had to preach a message on forgiveness to her. 
I never had to walk through a Bible study on the parables of the dangers of bitterness. I never had to speak a word or, or talk to her about it. the Holy Spirit without even me having to say anything convicted her. She looked up at me and she said, I need to forgive my husband. Right there. Without me saying a word. And I asked her, what, 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 what do you mean by that? And she begins to tell us a story. Five years ago, um, my husband abandoned me and my children for another woman and a family he had with her that we didn't know about. Here I am with three kids, some that are literally babies, and he disappeared, left, and left me and my kids for dead. He chose some other people for over us. And then she looked at me, and she had this look in her eye, and she said, and I've hated him, hated him ever since that day. Every time you even mention his name, something in me would just convulse, and an anger would arise in me, and I wanted him dead. But then she begins weeping again. She says, I need to forgive him. But I need to forgive him. If God was willing to forgive me right now, he needs, I need to forgive him. The Holy Spirit taught her that. The Holy Spirit of God taught her that. In that moment, we prayed over her. We prayed for deliverance. Uh, we prayed for internal emotional healing. We prayed for for the trauma that came with that, the Lord would work in her. And we saw the Holy Spirit come in that moment, brought healing to her soul. So God is a God who brings healing, not just to the body. He brings healing to the spirit too. And he's a God who brings healing to our souls, amen? And then second principle that I wanna talk about is that when it comes to healing, something that is so crucial and so important for you and me to have an understanding of is that it requires both expectation and trust. This is very critical. This is very important. It, it, within Christianity, there's many different camps. <laughs> there's many different uh, leanings that people have. And some people believe that, that you either have to have this radical faith and everything like that, 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 that. And on the other camp, people think, oh, anybody who prays for healing, they don't really trust God. Or vice versa, you know. It, but let me tell you, expectation, that radical faith of knowing who God is, that he will heal, is so important. But what is also important is on the other side. Because of who God is, the same reason why people have expectation that they have, it should be the same reason why we have the trust and perseverance that we have. Because I know who my God is, I will trust in him, whatever comes my way. It's, it's, it's so, so, so important. It's because, of my, we, because I know who he is, I have expectation. Every time I pray for somebody sick, I have the expectation, God, you are here, there's nothing too hard for you. You can heal. You will heal in Jesus' name. But at the same side of the coin, on the other side of we hear, I was like, trust, because God, you are so good and so good. I know, Lord God, that you are sufficient, that you carry us, that we can persevere in our time of the waiting. I've seen people like the woman at the restaurant that was healed instantaneously. I knew, but I've also seen people that were healed years after praying. Then I've seen people that we prayed for them, and then it took two weeks before the healing came. And they were on their own. It, it, it's unbelievable. But what is so important when it comes to expectation and trust is that these two are so important for us to have a, a healthy understanding of healing, for us to persevere. Not only persevere in the waiting, but to persevere in our faith. We need to persevere in the waiting and persevere in our faith. I have a dear friend of mine who I've prayed count 15 times that the Lord would heal him and heal him of this, this thing that he has. And 15 times I prayed with bold expectation. I will pray 16 times with bold expectation. I will pray 15 more times with bold expectation. 
And on the other side, we will worship and celebrate the Lord that my dear friend who knows Jesus is healed in the name of Jesus. I have this dear friend that began to tell me as we were walking through this, this hardship that he's in there, it, as, as we were both, we were functioning in both expectation and in trust. In the expectation, we would pray together for his healing over and over and over again. But on the other side, he would, we would worship the Lord our God who has already healed them. And what do I mean by that? He told me, when I enter heaven... Whether I get out of this chair now and dance before the Lord, I'm going to get out of my chair. Out. And years, whenever I'm in the heaven and I'm in the glory of God, I will dance before the Lord. And so I celebrate what God has done. I celebrate that I am his. I will dance before him and we will pray that I will dance before him now. So that is the two-sided coin that we, we use and that is so important when it comes to healing. I will pray for him again and again I'm going to pray that he will get out of this chair right now and dance with me before the Lord. But then on the other side of the coin, we celebrate and we trust that God, there is a day that's coming. There is a day that's coming that all things will be made right. So what my, my encouragement to you is this morning is don't, don't allow it, this to be an either or an or. And neither this, oh, we, we're a church that believes in healing or we're a church that we don't believe in healing, you know? We're a church that believes in healing and has full assurance in who God is. We will do our part. We will be obedient. What was that what he said? Go and pray for the sick. And we will trust in his part. He's the one who restores. He's the one who heals. Amen? I remember me and my dad went to this house as we were on a mission trip in, in Ecuador. In this home, they invited us in to come. I came with my guitar to sing, and my dad came with the word to preach and all these things. And as we're sitting there, it was a room that was very interesting. We had some that were Christians. They were all a group of friends. Some that were Christians, some that, that, that were another denomination, uh, some that, that weren't even believers, some that were even actually practicing some occult practices that were there. So I was like, oh, there's an interesting room that we're coming to minister to. <laughs> so, but we're like, Jesus, God, when you walk into the room, everything changes. It doesn't matter what people bring with them. When you're here, everything changes. So we begin to the worship. My dad brought a great message uh, uh, on healing and Christ as our healer. In that moment, we're like, all right, let's do it. <laughs> We're going to pray. And, and so all these ladies kind of like, they, we, they want to be prayed for for different things. And like the first one that comes up to pray, she comes and, and she has this, this neck thing that's on her neck, this, this stiffness that she can't move it. She just hasn't been able to move it. And it's excruciating pain just to move even a little bit. And she was praying, God, would you come and release this pain that's on my neck to release this, whatever's causing this. She didn't know. So we come, me and my dad, we, we get around her and say, all right, let's pray. And so we, my dad prays one time. And guess what? Nothing happened. <laughs> right? How many times do I want to give up there? But we asked her, or my dad asked her, and, and I, I learned this in, in that moment. My dad, can we pray again? And she was like, yeah, please. So we prayed again. Guess what happened the second time? Nothing happened. Nothing. So and then I was like, okay, I'll pray. Then I prayed again. Guess what happened the third time? Nothing. So we were like, can we, can we keep praying? Can, can we keep praying for you? She was so desperate. She was like, yes, please. Just keep praying. Just keep praying. So we're like, okay. We'll be like that widow that kept knocking on the door. <laughs> right? We'll, keep, we'll be like that widow that kept knocking all throughout the hours of the night asking for bread. So we kept praying, and it wasn't until the seventh or the eighth time, oh, well, something happened. Something broke loose, and the Lord touched her neck. And she was able to turn it, and we celebrated the Lord, and it opens a door that the Holy Spirit then began to move and touch all the rest of the people in the house. It was beautiful. It was amazing. But why do I tell you that story? We need to be perseverant in our prayers. As I was preparing this, the Lord just put on my heart a deep, a deep well of compassion 
that the Lord has a deep, deep, deep well of compassion for the one who's been praying and nothing's happening. I just sense the Lord just touch me and move my heart for the one who you, you're, you've been praying for something, praying for healing. God does not condemn you. I need you to hear that right now. I, who, whoever it is that needs to hear this, God does not condemn you. His heart is for you. His heart is for you. He will be the grace that carries you to persevere in your prayers. He will be the one that carries you to keep praying. So if you're here and you've said, yeah, but I've prayed for that a hundred times and nothing's happened. Can I invite you this morning, would you pray a hundred and one? God, but I've asked time and time again. Would you ask again? But what if nothing happens? But what if something does? What if something does? I want to invite you. You know, there's this saying that says, don't get your hopes up. Right? It's natural. It's human. When we get disappointed, when things don't go how we think we should go, let me tell you, we, we, we tend to try to give reasons for it. We, we sometimes even try to create theologies for it. But God is just inviting us into the mystery of trusting him. Trusting him. When we don't understand, trusting him. The be- best example I've seen of this, it, just, it was beautiful, was of uh, this woman that I met has a powerful, powerful ministry that in her ministry, it just, she, it's just known that she's, her ministry is marked by healing. And for some reason, very specifically of cancer. Um, and I met her, and I started, started uh, talking to her at this one conference that I went to. And her, her story is that she's, she's battled with cancer for years herself, and still is. Still is. And she shared, but that doesn't disqualify me. Many of us disqualify ourselves because we're struggling, we're in the battle right now with something. Disqualify ourselves from being the conduit or the vehicle that God wants to use to bring that breakthrough for somebody else. Oh, I I can't pray for that person for that. I mean, look at me. I can't pray for that person for healing when I need to be healed. Let me tell you, that is a lie of the enemy. God wants to use you. And in that moment, what it requires of us is a church, a people that have unwavering expectation and trust on who he is. God wants us to be a people that trust in who he is. And we, we, we wait and we allow both the expectation and the, and the trust be the catalyst and the, and the, the strength that gives us to persevere in this broken world for his imminent return. He's coming back, church. He's coming back. But you and me have work to do still. We have work to do still. Third point is this, we are the vehicle that God wants to use to bring healing into this world. You and me. Um, How many here have ever played the game of tag before? It's a famous game. How many like tag? It was fun when you were a kid, you run around. Let me tell you, there was a type of tag that I hated as a kid. It was the worst. You know what it was? It was called freeze tag. It was so boring. I was like, who came up with this game? This is the worst version of tag ever. So any kid would be like, let's play freestyle. I was like, no, let's not play that one. We're going to play a more fun one. Why did I hate it? Because when you get tagged, what do you do? You freeze. And then all of a sudden, the game's happening on the other side of the field, and you're stuck. You're like, man, this really is awful. This is so boring. I want to run. You know, you're a kid. And then you're sitting there. I'm like, oh, man, this is awful. And let me, let me tell you. 
My favorite form of tag was the one when the tagger would come and would tag you, and you didn't freeze, but he would tag you, and you were on his team now. And then you would run with him. There's a moment in the book of John, in John chapter 14. It's a beautiful discourse about the Holy Spirit, the promise that God is giving. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death, and he was going to go be with the Father. He's trying to coach him up. He's trying to get him ready. He's like a team captain. He's saying, all right, I'm coaching you up. When the Holy Spirit comes in John chapter 14, 12, there's this amazing thing that he says that. He says, when he comes for those who believe, you will do the same works that I do and even greater works than I. Imagine hearing that as a disciple. What? <laughs> That's crazy. Then he continues, he teaches them more about the Holy Spirit, and then he lands on John 20 at this end of this, this, this discussion. He's teaching with them, and, and this, this is the moment of after his death, after his resurrection, this moment, he comes to the disciples again, ascended, and he, as, as he resurrected, and he begins to talk to them. And there's this moment in John chapter 20, verse 21, is a moment where he comes upon the disciples, and he tells them, just as my father has sent me. He's saying, you've, you've walked with me for three years. You've watched everything that I've done. You've heard everything that I say. Just as my father has sent me, I send you now also. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. I love that moment because I call it the tag you are it moment. Tag you are it. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them. And guess what? Praise God that they didn't play freeze tag <laughs> and just stayed in Jerusalem forever. We're going to learn next week about the, the Holy Spirit, his baptism and all these things. They waited for a while because God needed to give them something, which was himself, the Holy Spirit and power to go out and be faithful witnesses of the gospel to all the earth. But praise God they didn't play freeze tag and just stayed there because you and me, we wouldn't be here today. They played that tag where they got tagged and what did they do? They joined his team. They ran with him. They saw him. They heard him. Now they went. And if you read the book of Acts, the parallels between Jesus and the disciples is, is staggering. Jesus was right. They went off to do the same and even greater works than I. So my question to you today, are you playing freeze tag? Are you playing freeze tag? If so, today is the day that God is saying, don't play freeze tag. Run with me. Jesus came to do, undo the works of the enemy. I want to invite the band, if you guys will come up and begin to minister to the Lord. Jesus came. Mm. He came to undo the works of the enemy. Jesus came. He went about preaching of the kingdom of God. Jesus came and he was about healing the leper, helping the helpless. He was about setting the captives free. He, he was about healing the broken. He was about destroying the works of the enemy. He was about delivering people who were tormented. Everything he said, is he said it because he heard his father say it. Everything he did is because he saw his father doing it. If Jesus needed to do that, how many know you and I really need to do that? You and I need to have ears to hear what he's saying. You and I need to have eyes to see what he's doing. Like my friend in the Mexican restaurant, praise God her, her eyes were open. And praise God her ears were open. Just want to invite you to stand this morning. if you just bow your heads I'd like to invite also any 
any prayer teams that are available, if you'd come up. I believe the Lord wants to do some amazing things right now. <laughs> Lord, and it's all for your glory, God. It's all for your glory. Jesus, come and do what only you can do. I just sense like the Lord wants to touch you know, two groups of people. First, you know, I believe that the Lord wants to heal today. The Lord is here. Whether that's body, if you have a physical ailment, we want to pray with you with expectation. Whether it's emotional healing, trauma, or maybe it's a soul healing of letting go and forgiving. whether it's uh, uh, the need of, of just I, I just really sense this like you've been praying for a long time and there's been like a cloud of disappointment over you just disappointment mm. yeah just the it's not, yeah. The Lord wants to let you hope again. He wants to let you hope again. Have you given up on that friend or family member? That feels so far away from God. The Lord is chasing them down. I want to invite you and encourage you. The Lord does not condemn you, but he's inviting you to hope again to pray again and to be surrounded by people that will pray again it is something that we see oftentimes in the scriptures and it's so true there is a need there's there's something so special about a physical act of obedience to represent a spiritual reality inside you see like it's not like there's something magical about this square inch of carpet right here. That's not it. The altar, coming to an altar, is, is not because there's some, yeah, magical thing right here. But what it is, it's an act of obedience, physical obedience, to a beckoning that God is doing inside of you. A physical act of obedience that, that is an inward reality of God. I'm coming to you. I need you now. Oh, how I need you now. So I want to pray for those who need healing this morning. Just wonderful teams. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to intercede. And we're going to do it with expectation, but with trust in who he is. Trust in who he is. In the second group, you're sitting here, and, and I think this is many of you or you're hearing these testimonies, you see the brokenness that's in this world, and your heart is burning, God, would you use me? Would you use me to be the vehicle for healing that you want to bring into this world? Oh God, would you use my mouth for the, the word that declares the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ to all the earth? Right now, your heart is burning, saying, God, will you use me, my voice? There's some of you right now that your heart is burning and say, God, would you use me, would you use my hands to bring healing into this world? Some of you, your heart is burning right now, and I believe that God is speaking to you and saying, God is speaking to you and your heart is burning because you want your feet to go wherever he wants you to go. Your heart is burning because you want to go where God is beckoning you. Some of you right now, your heart is burning because you want to see his will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. I just want to invite you if your heart is burning, burning right now, 
Use me, God. Use me, God. If that is the cry of our heart, we want to open this altar. Just fill this place, and you can come even now as I'm speaking. We're going to pray. We're going to worship. But would you take that act of, of physical obedience to real God and say, God, would you use me now? Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Would you burn my heart on fire, God? On fire for what you want to do in this earth. Would you use these hands? Would you use my voice? Would you use my life? I give my life as a living sacrifice to you. A living sacrifice. My life, I lay it on the altar. And I say, oh God, would you use me? So I just let the band minister. If that is you burning right now, the altars are open. If you need prayer, you see someone who needs prayer, leaders, pastors, just step in and minister. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord.